Within five years, the Queen of Darkness had near total control of Ancelon. Let's take a closer look. Welcome to another Dragonlance Saga episode. My name is Adam, and today we're going to talk about the War of the Lance timeline. I would like to take a moment and thank the members of this channel, and invite you to consider becoming a member by visiting the link in the description below. You can even pick up Dragonlance gaming materials using my affiliate link. I am referencing DL11 Dragons of Glory, Leaves from the Inn of the Last Home, and War of the Lance source books for this information. If I leave anything out or misspeak, please leave a comment below. The first event that pops into the mind of anyone who knows Dragonlance must be the War of the Lance. It is the seminal event that introduces us to the campaign world, its colorful cast of characters, and for some, the advanced Dungeons & Dragons game. But as much as is known about the War of the Lance, many are not even sure when it started, what events preceded it, and exactly how it ended. For example, if you're a gamer, there were many possible endings, with the journey to them filled with a continent of exploration and danger, mass combat with the battle system supplement, and immersion that has never been fully realized up to that point in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. For novel readers, you got one ending which excluded much that the modules presented so as not to spoil the possible Advanced Dungeons & Dragons encounters. Because Dragonlance Shadow of the Dragon Queen is now out, I would like to explore the official War of the Lance timeline and, hopefully, educate those who are new to the world in the process. The seeds of the War of the Lance were planted at the end of the 42-year-long Third Dragon War in the Age of Dreams at the Time of Nights in 1018 Prey Cataclius, when Huma banished the Queen of Darkness. He extracted a promise from her to forever leave the mortal realm and take her dragons with her to the abyss. She complied, and to maintain balance, as is an essential world element of Dragonlance, the good dragons also left, returning to the Dragon Isles to sleep. As dragons traveled into the realms of myth, an empire rose in the absence of the Dark Queen's shadow. The great empire of Istar, led by their king priest, rose to prominence and for the next thousand years, righteousness would reign. Well, almost. In the absence of the balance of evil, good will inevitably look for evil, even if it has to manifest it. They began with racial groups, then classes, and eventually the Edict of Thought Control. The gods of every alignment were upset by this, and ultimately, joined by Tachesis, who saw her opportunity to return and dominate the world, they sent a mountain crashing into Istar, punishing those who believed themselves to be better than the gods themselves. The Queen of Darkness needed a gateway to re-enter the world, and at the center of Istar was the Temple of Istar. This holy structure held the inherent power to allow her to pass through the Gate of Souls, creating a portal to the mortal realm. Just as the mountain rained down on Kryn, devastating the continents of Ancelon and Talidas, the Dark Queen stole the temple into the Abyss and planned to raise its mirror in Naraka, a region of darkness filled by warlords and her own mortal creations, the Ogres. For the next 341 years, disease, famine, war, and despair would descend upon Kryn as the gods left their mortal creations to their own designs. Could you imagine the immense folly of Istar, that the Age of Despair was its balancing act? In 141 Alt Cataclius, the Dark Queen planted the sacred foundation stone, the core of the Temple of Istar in Naraka, and for the next decade, she wandered the land in disguise, waking her dragons in secret. In 157 AC, two siblings would come upon the Foundation Stone, and as Barum, the brother, was stealing a green gemstone from the Foundation Stone, he accidentally killed his sister Jasla as she tried to stop him. This trapped Jasla's soul into the Foundation Stone, and the green gemstone became magically embedded into Barum's chest, granting him immortality. With her gate now closed, Tachesis would send her minions searching for the Everman so she could once again enter Kryn. In the years that followed, the Foundation Stone grew into a twisted version of the Temple of Istar, calling out to all of the evil in Kryn. The Dark Queen woke and threatened the good dragons with their eggs that, if they stayed out of the coming war, she would return their eggs after it, 
which her minions had stolen as the good dragon slept. Fearful for their offspring, the good dragons relented. This gave Tachesis's minions resources with which to experiment on, and eventually they perfected the ritual and draconians were born, infusing her army with seemingly unlimited troops. In the eight years following 332 AC, the Dark Queen formed the dragon armies with promises of wealth and dominion. At its head, she placed a former black robe wizard and ruthless warlord, Dulket Erikas. He would command her dragon armies, which were presented with the draconian troops in 342 AC. They controlled the Taman, Busuk, and Estwild regions by 337 AC. Erikas sent emissaries to Kern, Kur, and the Blood Sea Isles, and in 348 AC, the Red and Green Wings invaded the nation of Nordmar, which fell in less than two weeks, and the Blue Wing into Nusi for a future invasion of the Banassinia. In 349 AC, the Green Wing invaded Kur. Shortly thereafter, Goodland and Balafor were subsumed by the Black and White Wings. That spring saw the Dragon Armies breaking their truce with Sylvanesty, for the next year, the dragon armies experienced their bloodiest exchange with the elves before King Lorak Caledon sent his people into exile in southern Ergoth and used the dragon orb to defend his city. This did not go over well, and after losing control of the orb, a nightmare rose and overtook Sylvanesty, forcing the red, blue, and green wings to abandon the elven nation. The next year saw the dragon armies regrouping, consolidating, and establishing supply lines. The White Wing was sent south to Ice Reach, and the Black and Green Wings were assigned as engineers, sappers, and supply duties. In spring of 351 AC, the Blue and Red Wings mobilized west. The Blue Wing entered the Dergard Mountains, taking Calaman, Hinterlund, and Nightland. The Red Wing moved into Throt and Lemish. This led to Salanthus and Thelgard being sacked. By summer of 351 AC, the Red Wing crossed New Sea and occupied Zak Saroth and Pax Tharkaz. By autumn, Quilinasi fell, seeing the Quilinasi elves retreating to southern Ergoth like their Sylvanesty cousins. By winter of 351 AC, the dragon armies held much of Anselon from Nordmar to Calaman and from Goodland to Abanasinia. The Whitestone forces were faced with a seemingly insurmountable task in overcoming the Dark Queen's forces. It would be the rediscovery of the Dragonlances and the knowledge of the fate of the good dragon's eggs that would be their catalyst for hope. Faced with the return of holy clerics and a unified Whitestone force, and the death of many of the Dragon Army's High Lords, Erika's demanded that Palanthus should be conquered at any cost. The Blue Wing descended on the High Clarice Tower, but were defeated by the Whitestone Force's use of a dragon orb. The sacrifice of Sturm Brightblade and the revelation that the High Clarice Tower was in fact built as a dragon trap revealed the first true victory for the Whitestone Forces. With the dragon lances in hand and the return of the good dragons, the Whitestone Forces would go on to retake Calaman in the spring of 352 AC and turned their forces south to Naraka across Estwild. In an act of desperation, the Blue Wing captured the Whitestone General, halting the Whitestone forces as the Golden General's companions continued on to Naraka. Erikas summoned his dragon high lords to Naraka to witness the triumphant return of Tachesis, but what transpired was anything but. Tanis Half Elven would kill Erikas with the aid of Raceland Majir, who would then go on to see the redemption of Barum, stopping the Dark Queen's return for good. The temple that was the heart of her return exploded, and her millennia long plans were foiled by the Whitestone forces and the heroes of the Lance. This would be far from the end of the Dragon Armies and war, but the War of the Lance was ostensibly concluded and balance restored to Kryn. For a little while, at least. <laughs> but that is all I have to say about the timeline of the War of the Lance. What do you think of the story? Were it not for Barum, do you think Tachesis would have been successful? And finally, is it fair to give credit to any Golden General when it took the return of good dragons and the Dragonlance for the Whitestone forces to turn the tide of war? Leave a comment below. I would like to take a moment and remind you to subscribe to this YouTube channel, ring the bell to get notified about upcoming videos, and click the like button. This all goes to help other Dragonlance fans learn about this channel and its content. Thank you for watching. This has been Adam with Dragonlance Saga, and until next time, remember... Understood her? Admired her.
her. Like I myself, she was meant to rule, destined to conquer. But she was stronger than I was. She could throw aside love that threatened to chain her down. But for a twist of fate, she would have ruled all of Ancelon. Thank you.